Hi everyone and welcome to the first Rural Doctors broadcast of 2012 and a great big Happy New Year to you all. I'd just like to take this opportunity to remind you about the Rural Health West annual conference and trade exhibition that we're running on the 3rd and 4th of March this year. Uh, the program's fantastic, it's on, on our website. Um, I'd really encourage you to jump on onto the web and have a look at the program um, and encourage you to start making your plans to be there because it's one of those conferences you're really going to want to be at. The conference is, as usual, on the Saturday and the Sunday morning and following the Sunday morning events we'll be holding the annual Rural Health West Doctor Service Awards. I'd also like to really encourage you to be at that as well because it's a fantastic event. It's an opportunity where we really get to recognise you and your peers for the wonderful work you do out there in rural Western Australia. So we have the conference, we have the awards, and this year we have something else which is on the Friday before the conference, which is a special workshop we're doing in collaboration with the RACGP, and it's about taking on telehealth and taking on telehealth in your practice. The program for that workshop is all about how you might start doing telehealth video consultations, what you might need to, to get in terms of software, hardware, the barriers, the enablers, fantastic lineup of GPs who are going to take us through the day. It's capped at 100 people, so once again, get online, have a look at that program, and we'll look forward to seeing you down here. Hello, I'm Jerry Gellin. Welcome back to another year of Rural Doctors. First up this year, we're joined once again by Professor Mark Tennant from the Centre for Rural and Remote Oral Health to discuss what doctors and other health professionals can do and what they shouldn't do in the mouths of their patients. Mark Tennant joined Dr Olga Ward. Mark, welcome to the program. Thank you. In fact, welcome back to the program. Yeah, yeah, irregular, regular. Dental problems go around and come around and they always seem to end up at the GP, particularly when you've got a visiting dentist who's there once a fortnight. I guess perhaps the most common problem to a general practitioner mm. is pain. Um, how do we actually work out where the pain's coming from? Like, is it really a toothache? And what are the things that work best for dental pain? Yeah, you know, um, dental pain is often tricky because you have sinus troubles and you've got ear troubles, you have a whole sequence of things that you need to separate it from. I think one of the core questions is, did this wake you up last night? Mm -hmm. And if a patient responds yes to that, then you really do have a significant dental issue. Um, other tricks is uh, to use the back end of some sort of metal instrument and give each tooth a little tap. Mm -hmm. Obviously, gently, and you start at the normal teeth first and uh, usually a person will give a little reaction when you tap on a tooth with an abscess on the bottom of it. Yeah. And what to do and, and what can you do about that sort of situation? I suppose the, the, the first thing is you want your patient to be out of pain. So mm -hmm. we're really talking about uh, some pain medications, whatever you think is relevant to the level of their pain feeling. Um, and, and secondary, um, the issue around uh, this is an inflammatory process, so use of some uh, inflammatories is, is quite good, um, anti-inflammatories is quite good. The, um, there, there's obviously a discussion about using antibiotics and things in this story. Yep. Um, uh, we don't jump into using antibiotics immediately, really pain reduction is the, is the core, mm -hmm. um, to actually treat the problem, the antibiotics will not actually completely resolve the problem. These sorts of toothaches, particularly ones where patients have said it woke me up last night, are not resolvable by just giving them some antibiotics and 10 days later they'll be better. So we really need to emphasise to the patient that they are going to need to see the dentist regardless of... Whatever you do, they are going to need some dental care in the end, be it an extraction or as many people these days have uh, nerve fillings, you know, you take yep. out the pussy core of this decayed tooth mm -hmm. and allow it to drain and then we fill up the, the central core. But they're, they're really activities for a dentist, so you're going to need a dentist yeah. in the end. Now you said it was often more inflammatory. Um, surely we should see something maybe along the gum? Um, you know, it's, that's quite tricky because often uh, the, the primary place for an abscess on a tooth is actually at the apex of that tooth, which yeah. is embedded in the alveolar bone. So the initial abscess formation is within alveolar bone mm -hmm. and therefore you don't see an overt abscess like we would for you know, skin abscess or something. Mm -hmm. um, it's only after that abscess has actually made a sinus through onto the gingiva or uh, submandibular or other regions in the face. And that, that's a 
that's a pretty end stage of the process. 99% of them, you wouldn't see that happen. Um, the good news with children is that uh, Princess Margaret has a uh, on-call dental service. So even if you're anywhere in the state or mm -hmm. anywhere else, you can actually ring up and uh, they will connect you through the exchange to uh, a dentist who you can talk through and actually do some more questioning and work up of what the problem mm. might be. What about those really old fashioned things like clove oil? Mm. And I have seen parents sticking half a disprin against uh, children's gums, yep. which gives me yep. the freakies that they're going to burn their gum. Absolutely. Clove oil is mm. a very common historic. My grandparents were into it. Everyone was into it for a yep. long while. Um, if it mentally makes you feel better, then go forth. Yep. But uh, the evidence around it actually doing something is not really present. And you're absolutely right with the aspirin. You know, the reality of putting an aspirin on a tooth is you're going to end up with a great big burnt buccal gingiva or buccal mucosa or something like that. And it's not actually going to do any more good than swallowing the thing. So what we see in the country, as well as the kiddies with an acute toothache, and for that matter, the adults with acute toothache, is sometimes the most totally decayed, crumbling, <laughs> black, rotten, stumpy things. Um, and the patient comes in and goes, it hurts. And you think, yes, well, that's pretty jolly obvious. Yeah. Should you fish out any of the broken, crumbly bits or do you just kind of leave it there and go, barely see the dentist? Well, you know, you know uh, um, I'm certainly not into, without proper training, trying to take entire teeth out. And I've, um, the photo you can see at the moment, you can see the teeth, sort of I describe them like the iceberg, the Titanic hit, the bit you yeah. can see above the gum is only about an eighth of what's below the gum. Yeah. So actually extracting teeth is, needs some training and, yep. a, and a process to do. Um, however, the sort of mouth you're describing with bits floating everywhere, yeah. you know, the reality is if you can get a pair of artery forceps and take off some of the, you know, the sharp bits that are annoying the person, or if you can uh, use some of the materials around, and there are some dental materials that you can access to um, smooth off those and cover up those sharp bits until mm -hmm. they get to a dentist. Usually in old country hospitals, you can find a very small bone rasp, which is quite a useful thing to do. Yeah, anything you can use to uh, smooth some of the rough edges off, that's fine. The one proviso in that is, um, often in those cases, the, the, the pulp of the tooth is open to the mouth mm -hmm. and that's a pathway of drainage for abscesses. Yeah. So you don't want to be filling up, you know, it's like putting a plug in a sinus, you don't want yeah. to do that. So uh, just be a little bit careful if you're going to smooth something by adding some dental materials mm -hmm. that you don't actually, don't try and cover the whole tooth because you could make the situation worse. Yeah. So really a temporary, a temporary kind of filling when you're just trying to spack fill something is usually where somebody's just taken their filling out in a toffee exactly. and you need to just cover up the exactly. sore bit until they get to the dentist. Exactly. You know, and the reality of those sorts of mouths with decay everywhere is they're going to need some sort of, you know, probably some sort of general anaesthetic mm -hmm. and let's clean all this pus and debris out and have a fresh mm -hmm. start. Now, speaking of pus and debris, and you've talked about antibiotics and analgesics, and the best analgesics being anti-inflammatory, what sort of antibiotic spectrum are we looking at? Oh, the reality with, with um, dental infections, and I'm going to talk a little later about another type of dental infection, pericoronitis, mm -hmm. but the reality is some of the broad spectrum are the, the better targeted antibiotics. Um, we do have some uh, significant anaerobic Mm -hmm. infections, so uh, um, some of the flagels and things are quite useful yep. as well. Would you but need something broad spectrum and metronidazole and flagel? Um, yeah, like we, I always remember yeah. amoxicillin and flagel yeah. used to be the two, and you know, two stick things with that it. you did. Stay with stick it. with it. Stick with it. Um, uh, usually the amoxyl is probably the broad spectrum one we use common, mm -hmm. commonestly, um, but flagel for some infections is good. You did talk about gum disease and you mentioned pericoronitis and a few other things. What causes those swollen gums that you get with some of the medications? You don't see it quite so much these days, but certainly used to see it with phenytoin. Yeah, and you know, look, I'm no expert on uh, uh, 
uh, the uh, epileptic, epilepsy drugs and things. But I, I get the feeling too that this, you guys have shifted what you use. And so the, the problem of overgrowing gums with some of the epilepsy drugs is sort of a diminishing problem. Yeah. Um, however, I, I want to make people aware that there is many, many drugs that actually also cause dry mouth. And uh, for dentistry, dry mouth's a really worrisome problem. Um, the important thing is obviously to have a look in MIMS when you prescribe something and see if it causes dry mouth. Um, dry mouth, your, the, your teeth are only present because they are in an equilibrium balance with your saliva. So if you take the saliva away, the mineral starts to come out of your teeth and you can have very significant decay really rapidly. So patients who are taking, say, old-fashioned antipsychotics or some, something that's very anticholinergic may have a problem, but advising them to drink water isn't going to solve the problem? It, 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 it will make diminish the problem somewhat, but it's no. Really, if you're going to put someone on, or if someone is on drugs that are going to reduce their saliva flow, please mm -hmm. get them a dental appointment yeah. and make it clear to the dentist that that's what's going on. Because, you know, you can have... Uh, you know, I've seen, you know, within six or eight months, every tooth decayed in a person's mouth mm. through dry mouth. So the place I think where I've seen this the most is the head and neck radiotherapy. Yeah, absolutely. Where they, they do destroy yeah. most of the salivary glands. Yeah. How do you get around that? Well, look, most of those patients are under a multidisciplinary care team, which often includes dental. Mm -hmm. And so they are actively managed around their dry mouth. And there's a, a bunch of saliva replacement drugs, whatever you'd like to call them, yep. uh, and uh, keeping their mouth moist and things is a priority in those patients. A lot of them will actually probably rock up with a clear knowledge of what they're supposed to be doing to uh, uh, keep their mouth moist and things. So uh, I even remember the old fashioned well lemon and glycerin swabs, do they actually do yeah, anything Yeah, that's useful? exactly right. There's, there's a whole bunch of stuff around that now, but seek advice. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you have a patient like that, Royal Perth Hospital is the core um, facility for head and neck cancer. Some is now down at Fremantle. But if you ring up, you can speak to the uh, oral surgery registrar and they'll give you some additional advice if you need any advice on that sort mm -hmm. of stuff. Can we just go back to those gum overgrowths? Because not yeah, everybody yeah. has been taken off their phenytoin. Yeah. If you do have a patient whose gums have grown three quarters of the way down yep. their teeth, why did they get that way? And how can the doctor help them to... Can, like, can they get back a normal looking mouth? Yes, they can. Uh, it'll take some uh, specialist care to actually get them get the overgrowth gone back, mm -hmm. uh, specialist dental care. Yep. Um, but then um, one of the things, the core things, is about keeping those teeth clean, yep. keeping plaque, and, uh, because that actually drives up the process mm -hmm. and really working on, you know, being vigilant about brushing and toothpaste and those sorts of things. Okay. Do they have to take any special care when they're flossing? No. No, no. We just, just have to advise them to brush keep and floss twice a day. Keep at it. To be honest, though, uh, the flossing story, uh, we don't give such a huge emphasis these days to the flossing story. Um, it's, it's, if you do it, fantastic. But for lots of people, it's quite hard to do and quite life invasive. Yeah. Um, I'd rather see a person brush two or three times a day. Yeah. Than brush once a day and have to try and floss once a day. You know. Push mm -hmm. the brushing, that's the, that's the emphasis here. Um, interdental brushes are really quite good brushes and uh, particularly for people who've ended up with some gaps between their teeth and that happens. Mm -hmm. uh, are they the things that look like a little mascara brush? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, or you know, a little conical shaped thing and you can brush between your teeth. They work really well, particularly when people have their gums have started to recede mm -hmm. apically on their teeth. You get bigger gaps so you can use interdental brushes, so they're very good. And let's be quite clear, wooden toothpicks, good. You know, it doesn't have to be floss. There's many ways to clean the plaque from between your teeth. And is there a list somewhere of drugs that cause this kind of dental effect? Um, uh, to be honest, these days with MIMS and electronic MIMS and things, it's certainly written against each drug in their, uh, the, the, mm -hmm. their dental consequences, dry mouth, uh, so really, if we've got somebody that we think might be at risk because of immune suppression or long-term anti-epileptics or oh, whatever, we should scroll down should the product information and look for dental, dental or dental and oral, oral issues. Effects. 
and, and you know, dry mouth is, is the core one to look for because many of the drugs have that effect these days. For patients with that kind of gum overgrowth, um, often if epileptic, not with a great deal of earning capacity and therefore often on a part pension or a full pension, this is something that would definitely come under an extended primary care dental plan. Oh, unequivocally, absolutely. Um, and uh, the, the EPC process, uh, there are not, not all dentists participate, and it's actually yeah. somewhat difficult to find dentists who participate. Yes, as we know. <laughs> but uh, uh, for cases like that, um, certainly, you know, there will be people who will make space and make that happen. Um, if you get stuck, you can always, particularly if patients have uh, health care cards, mm -hmm. they're eligible for the specialist care through the government, state government, forget EPC for a minute, they're eligible through the state government for specialist care mm -hmm. through the oral health centre. Um, and you could probably put a reasonable argument about uh, PATS for some of those complex issues like that as well. I know PATS and dental is something we don't talk too much about because it's not so good, but uh, for, for complex, unique problems like that, you can put a fairly strong argument and Pats should cover some of those. The kind of state government funded treatment that you're talking about, is that only available in the city? Dental disease these days is a disease really of poverty or marginalisation. Um, so, you know, State government dental care is somewhat overwhelmed because they, they, they have the majority of diseases in the group of people they're supposed to be looking after. But there is uh, government dental clinics spread around Western Australia. Um, so, you know, please make uh, look at their website, Dental yeah. Health Services of Western Australia, and uh, you will find a list of the addresses and phone numbers for where clinics are. Yep. Um, some of the Aboriginal medical services in Western Australia now have dental services as well. Geraldton, Kalgoorlie, Roeburn, um, Carnarvon, um, Walluna, Warburton. So mm. there's a sequence of places where Aboriginal medical services have dental and that's slowly growing around the state as well and uh, that's a very effective process. Um, Aboriginal people suffer really significantly, you know, call it two, three, four times the amount of dental disease of non-Aboriginal people. Um, so I'm a big promoter of Aboriginal medical services having their, dental, their own dental services and, yeah. and working together to have that service. Well, Mark, in general practice, and particularly in the country, the patients will turn up in our emergency departments and sometimes at the surgery with a knocked out permanent tooth. And people say, well, just shove it back in and put some alfoil on it. And I'm not too sure about shoving it back in, yep. how to do it, and I'm certainly not too sure about how to put the alfoil in. So could you maybe talk us through the steps yeah. of, yeah. you know, what sort of things to expect when you see the trauma and yeah. what happens when you stick the alfoil on? Well, it's interesting, Olga, you used a word permanent tooth in mm -hmm. that sentence, and I think that's a really important message to get first. With, um, with baby teeth, yep. baby teeth we don't put back in because underneath the baby tooth, the adult tooth is forming. So if you're trying to rummage around and push a baby tooth back, you're doing more damage to the adult tooth sitting above it than you are doing good. Yep. So primary teeth don't go back in. Um, adult teeth, well, we do want you to put them back in, particularly if you're at distance. We know, and you can see in this uh, histological picture, that um, the tooth is actually separated from the bone by a ligament. So it actually isn't welded to the bone. It's, it's actually got a live living ligament around it. Right, and that's this thing that's called the periodontal, periodontal ligament. Periodontal ligament, that's right. So uh, when a tooth is knocked out, the periodontal ligament and its fibroblasts and everything else in it are still attached to the tooth. So they go through the mud and the football field and everything else on mm -hmm. their journey back to you. Um, so the first thing we want you to do with a tooth that's knocked out is not to scrub it not to use iodine on it to clean off the dirt or things like that. Um, the best thing you can use is milk. And, uh, so you don't give it a rinse first under the tap to get rinse rid of in the milk. grit? Rinse in milk. Yep. Milk is the best thing. People are always asking me, what sort of milk? I've had everything, you know, chopped milk, the whole range of questions. <laughs> Reality is plain, standard, 
whole cream milk if you've got it. Mm -hmm. um, use that to uh, store the tooth in. And the other point here is it's the time that's critical. You know, dental is not, it's not like you guys. We, we don't have much that time means anything, but for putting teeth back or for getting them in milk, time means something to us. Mm -hmm. And we measure this in, you know, five minute aliquots of time. So, so say you've got some someone, young lad on a footy field and he's whopped out one of his front incisors at the edge of a boot. You, go, you ask someone in, to get milk. Straight into your 300 mil carton of milk and give it a good shake. Don't even shake it, just get, get it the in the milk. Get out of it. Get it in the milk. Um, the milk is isotonic. Mm -hmm. The milk also has a bunch of nutrients which will help keep that ligament alive on that tooth. Mm -hmm. Get it into milk. Yep. And really then it comes down to sort out the medical issues mm -hmm. and then the idea of putting the tooth back. Just out yeah. of interest, if you suspected that they might have a, a little jaw fracture underneath where they've lost the tooth, yep. would you still be processing along this, uh, I'm going to yeah. put the tooth back in line? Yeah, you would. Uh, and it's not uncommon to have uh, small alveolar fractures around a, a traumatised tooth and things. Mm -hmm. Now, the good news is, if you're really scared about this whole process, you can always ring PMH and a dentist will speak to you straight away evenings, weekends, whenever. Um, so feel free to ring up. Someone yep. will help you through the process and talk you along and give you a little bit of strength to do it if, if that's necessary. Yep. Um, the idea in putting the tooth back is uh, don't pick it up by the root surface. You, you've seen in the slide there that we've got uh, um, that living ligament on this tooth. So when you pick it up, pick it up by the crown of the tooth or the, or the bit that you can see normally in a mouth. Yeah. Now I've got a sequence of photographs here that I want to show you and this is of a, of a kid. Yeah. This is a classic case. Male kid, evening time, rocks up at Princess Margaret having come adrift from their bike. And you can see in the first photograph what their face looks like. You can see drips of blood down their shirt and you can understand that you've got a upset parent in this process yeah. too, so you have to manage the social part of this deal too. Um, often when you look in a kid's mouth, it will look like this second photograph, you'll have blood and bits everywhere and uh, when it's not your field of expertise, it's probably confronting to see it. Yeah. So you can see in the next photograph here, the first thing to do is just clean that all away. Get mm -hmm. some gauze, get all the mess away and, uh, and have, a, uh, have a good look at what's gone on. And in this case, the kid hasn't knocked it completely out. But we'll, you know, for assumption, let's assume the kid's knocked it out. And uh, the idea is to pick the tooth up by the crown and push it back into the socket where it came from. Now, a couple of little tricks here. First trick is, please get the front to the front and the back to the back, you know? Yeah. I've seen a few where docs have put them back 180 degrees around. That's cool. We can fix it later, but it makes it a lot easier if you get the front to the front. How do you know? Just look at the one to the other side or, you know, the convex surface is always to the outer surface. But often in the milieu of a upset parent and a crying kid, you run the risk of getting them back to front. Because they actually slip into the socket nicely, and that's the other little key thing here. Mm -hmm. The socket is like a funnel shape, a cone. So as you push it back, with a little bit of finger force, it will actually sort of slide in and find its home, find its site, really quite nicely without any need for anaesthetic. Mm -hmm. you know, the adrenaline of the moment will allow you to put it back in. Now, a couple of things there. Um, if it doesn't go back in nicely, you probably have some fracture around the alveolar area and it's, mm -hmm. it's not going to seat properly. And then your decision becomes, how far from dental care am I? How long away is it? If you're within, you know, within range, an hour or so of, of dental help, tooth back in the milk, patient and the tooth, off to dental help. Please, this doesn't mean ambulance, helicopter, you know, just, you know, this is, uh, unless they have other medical issues, this is not that sort of rush, but off to dental help. If you are further than that away, then uh, maybe some phone calls to PMH, a little perseverance to try and squeeze it around some of that alveolar fracture or to put it in a place where it's close but not quite. And actually you can see in the next photograph here that uh, 
this kid has moved his teeth. So you can mm -hmm. see we actually test the bite, how the teeth come together. Yep. And you can see in this photograph how it's a sort of traumatic occlusion. You can see that uh, the tooth has moved so much that you can't actually bite together properly. So that's when you actually have to sort of try and straighten it up a little bit and, and use a little bit of finger force with some gauze mm -hmm. to push it back into a straight position. And that raises the last part of the journey, which is splinting. Yeah. Um, now, what I've done also is I've, I've got a photograph here of another child who's uh, actually had a splint made by a doctor in uh, uh, just south of Mandurah. Yeah. And uh, one of the great things to use is alfoil. And you can see here uh, the, the child has had an alfoil splint placed around all these teeth to hold that uh, avulse tooth back in its place. And it's been splinted with a whole bunch of alfoil. Now, this alfoil splint... I would call the grandiose model. I think you can actually do it with a little less alfoil on this. Poor kid, uh, the taste of alfoil is most unpleasant, so. Uh, yeah, so how do you actually create an alfoil splitting? Um, origami. <laughs> you cut a, a long strip of, of uh, alfoil and then you fold it up to make it somewhat more rigid and then just squeeze it around their teeth with the right, tooth so in place. So you still need to make it long enough to go front surface to back. Front surface, surface to back, but not right up into their, what we call sulcus area, not right up into their sulcus, and make it a reasonable length too, so it's got some strength to it. If they've got a footy mouth guard that they stupidly weren't wearing, can you just use that? Absolutely. A anything that will hold this in place is important. Now, you have to be reasonably smart about this in terms of patient selection here, because if you've got a kid, a younger child, who's screaming and crying and inconsolable, you've got to be way up the risk of aspirating this tooth on its journey and things. So, um, you know, use, use your smarts about the, the choice of cases here. Mm -hmm. um, if this child is going to... If you're running the risk of the kid aspirating this tooth, it falling back out of the socket and aspirating it, then back in the milk and transport the two together. Um, the other photo I've got here that I'm just showing you now is actually what happens at the dentist. So you just know what's going to go on here. Yep. At the dentist, what we end up doing is we uh, glue a piece of orthodontic wire across the teeth mm -hmm. and that tooth is held in place by the orthodontic wire for a period, usually about two weeks. And then that's while the ligament reintegrates and uh, it will, it will mm -hmm. take back, in a sense. <laughs> For those of us who do live a little bit further than just like an hour away from the dentist yeah. um, or who only have visiting dentists, yep. how long can the tooth sit in the milk with the patient waiting to, yeah. to trot off like if, if they had, say, a six-hour drive? Is uh, that a big problem? Um, if it's in the milk? Yeah. No. We, you know, it's obviously a time-dependent curve here, so the odds are going lower. Yep. But, uh, um, you know, six hours is still not unreasonable to have it in yeah. milk. Now, one more thing I'm going to raise, and you can see in this photo uh, a kid where you think the dentist is sort of dragging their lip off mm -hmm. their face sort of thing. That's done on purpose, and, and when you have a trauma case, I think you, know, you should follow the same protocol here. Really have a good lift of the lip and pull down of the lower lip and look for um, you know, trauma to the gingiva and the mucosa around the area. Um, often it sort of hides... Because obviously as the, you know, as, as the kid's taken a period to get to you, the bleeding has stopped and, you know, it's sort of coagulated in the area. So you don't actually see it. It's only when you lift the lip up you see, you know, a, a great big traumatic lesion across the interior of their mouth yeah. that may require some suturing and things like that. How successful are these uh, tooth re-implantations and how do you know when, uh, despite best care, best effort and beautiful orthodontic wire, that tooth isn't going to make it. Um, look, like I said, it's, it's a curve. It's dependent on that dry time. That's the core to this story. Um, they are pretty successful, reasonably successful. Uh, I, you know, I can't give you... A, it depends on the case, but, you know, 70 80% success rate. Now, part of this is how long is the success? What is success, you know? Uh, for a growing child, one of the measures of success here is can we get them can that tooth last till the post-growing? And then we can do implants and all sorts of things these days to replace that missing mm -hmm. tooth. So, it, so might, it might just look a bit grey and manky, but it will, it's it, solid. Exactly, because we want the, 
the tooth actually helps drive the bone growth around it. Mm -hmm. So we want that bone to grow nicely until they're you know, adult stable bone that then we can use to implant a tooth, implant and then a tooth construct on top. So success is a tricky word. Um, some teeth after implant will, will last a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Now they do need a bunch of follow-up dental care. Yep. So trauma is not one off, stick the wire on, take the wire off and that's it. Because obviously depending on the closure of the root canal, yep. they may need a nerve filling and all sorts of things done as well. So it's an ongoing process of care. Mm -hmm. The other thing that our teenagers come in with is they're erupting wisdom teeth. Yeah. Not often coincident with erupting wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> you have teenagers. Uh, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they've got that flap of gum that sits over them and they chomp on it and it gets yeah. big and red and puffy and infected. Yeah. What do I tell them to do? What can I do for them? Well, I was going to say there's something you can do and it's, and it's actually very effective. Yeah. Um, in this picture you can see some examples of uh, what we call pericoronitis, which is really just, you know, imagine what little tackers go through with their teeth yeah. erupting, you know, they, they don't say anything about it, it's the teenagers who speak up. Uh, so this pericoronitis is really just a little uh, a flap of the gingiva that grows over the top of uh, uh, erupting teeth. And it just acts as a catchment zone for um, bacteria and plaque. And, and, and that's where you get a bacterial infection and that's where you know, the pain problem starts. So what you can do as a doc is um, wash underneath that little flap. Mm -hmm. Which is often a big red It's a thing. big red ugly looking thing, you know? Yep. Um, and to wash under it, um, a syringe and a blunt needle. Um, please mm -hmm. don't inject stuff into people. This is about washing underneath it. So you want something so blunt. So maybe just the tubing from a butterfly? I was about to say, a little bit of tubing from a butterfly. Anything you can find that's sort of blunt. But when you do it, you want to actually wash underneath the flap. Mm -hmm. Don't just sort of stand at the back of the room and sort of squirt it in their mouth. You want to get the solution. Mm -hmm. um, and we're talking chlorhexidine here. Use some chlorhex. Yep. All docs will have. And give it a good wash. Don't... Uh, don't just use a 5 mil syringe and give them a little squirt like that. Use a 30 mil syringe and give it a good wash underneath there. And you won't believe it, but those teenagers will actually be feeling better before they leave your surgery. It's actually quite a rapid process of washing away that sort of problem. Um, that's stage one, okay. <laughs> obviously. So you actually will sort of slide your angled tubing underneath there. Slide your there, tube under the flap squirt, and just squirt, keep squirt. squirting. Just shh and just wash. Remind Move the patient the tube around to spit a bit. because we don't often have an intraoral vacuum. You're going to need a bit of a bucket or something or yep. do it over the sink or however you can do it. Mm -hmm. But just give it a good wash underneath it. Move it around a little bit. So yep. you move around all the, under all the flaps there and wash it all out. Catch all the Doritos as they pop out. Yeah, <laughs> well now you've raised the other thing. Because this is also often linked with poor oral hygiene. So a tad of a harassment about brushing your teeth mm -hmm. um, is a good thing here. Do remember that uh, most of these cases in the end are probably going to end up with having their wisdom teeth removed. You know? yep. This is the number one reason for hospitalising a teenage kid in Western Australia, beyond anything else that you guys do. Mm -hmm. So uh, wisdom tooth extraction is, is extremely common. So this might be a signal to start on that journey and get, some, uh, get them on the dental journey to looking at whether their wisdom teeth are actually going to have an adequate space or not to fit in their mouth and whether removal of wisdom teeth is required or not. Now once that tooth is out and the dentist has gone back to Perth yep. and the patient comes in at 3 o'clock in the morning and goes which I think translates for dental speak to gosh that socket really hurts. Yep. Um, Often you kind of had a look and they've got a dry socket. Well, you've got to be careful here. They're, it could be just pain associated with having your wisdom tooth out or any tooth out. You know? yep. So, you, you know, you, there's, a, there's a subtlety here about dry socket. Dry socket is a specific condition really where you're getting some necrosis of the bone around that, uh, that extraction socket. Mm -hmm. um, we have a whole sequence of things that are possible causes and reasons. And the number one on our list for a, a, an implicated factor here is smoking. 
Yep. Clearly, smoking and having teeth out increases your risk of having a dry socket. Yep. So, harassment about <laughs> not... Sm dentists, we're, we're onto it big time. Harassment about don't smoke for a while after you've had your tooth out is a, is a really strong thing for us. And if you can help us to follow that through, that's important. Okay. Basically, all you need to do is when you look in the socket and have a, have a look, you will see that it sort of looks, it, it's minus a clot and it looks sort of whitey coloured and things in there. Yep. Uh, usually in a, in a tooth extracted socket, you expect to see a clot. Yep. You know, it's normal and process. Mushy stuff, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Your probable immediate mental reaction here is, uh, necrotic bone, gee, I better dig that all out, you know, and uh, yeah. the reality is you, um, you, you know, the natural process of removing that will actually happen in the longer term. So you don't need to start getting Curating. out your surgical kit and thinking I'm going to dig all this out, so just don't, that's not, not mm -hmm. cricket. Certainly um, um, some of the um, flagell, the, the uh, antibiotic will be helpful, yeah. and we also have some uh, dry socket paste that has been historically used yep. that they can push into a socket. What will happen, and you will see it even with not dry sockets, with normal tooth extraction, sometimes you see little spicules of bone coming out through the uh, healing tooth socket. You could actually uh, pick them out. You can pick those out. That's just fine. Um, and, and that's not... I want to emphasise both dry socket and that is not that the extraction was a bad extraction or, you know, the dentist put their knee on their chest or, you know, mm -hmm. that is a, a normal uh, complication of any sort of extraction. It's not uh, that there was excessive trauma or anything like that. Do you need to pack the socket with anything or um, irrigate it with anything or gelify it up with anything? Uh, no, to I think, I think leave it alone. Some antibiotics and uh, obviously some painkillers mm -hmm. and uh, get it resolved. Earlier we were talking about fillings and the fact that maybe GPs shouldn't be filling rotting teeth, but there is always the patient who bites into a nice sticky toffee and neatly extracts their molar filling straight out yeah. and just basically needs something to cover the hole yep. until they can get to the dentist who is coming Tuesday week. Yeah. Um, can we do something for that? Yeah, and, and uh, you, the, the only proviso I'd put on that is just be sure that the filling actually just dropped out because it dropped out. It didn't drop out because there was a great big cavernous decayed lesion around it. Then uh, a, 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 some temporary filling material is, is quite reasonable um, yep. and doable. Uh, need to do a little bit of practice because often the mixing of it is quite tricky. So I know it sounds crazy, but have a few goes to, to try mixing dental filling material before you actually do the real run. Mm -hmm. because they And we could maybe get our local dentist to show us how to do that? Absolutely. I, I, next Christmas party, pop in and ask them, could they uh, give you a little demo on some simple, we call it glass on a cement. Um, mm -hmm. The trick with it is it's chemically cured. So it goes off fast. So you've got to be quite efficient, you know. You've got to mm -hmm. probably have an assistant to hold all the cheek and lips out of the way and mix it and put it in with some efficiency. Yep. The other little trick with it, and your dentist will, when he gives you some lessons on it, the dentist will explain that it's also water sensitive while it's still moist. So what you want to do is dry the area first mm -hmm. and then put it on and that's when it will stick nicely and last till the dentist. The other end point here is um, I know a lot of people will come and ask you to do this sort of thing. Yep and think that it's endpoint care. You know, this is it, yeah. I don't have to go to the dentist. Well, it, will, it won't so last. So you just have to keep saying to them, this is a tooth band-aid. Exactly, this will not last. This material is not strong enough to last forever. So uh, they are going to need dental care. And I think if I was in your shoes, if I'd done this once and a person came back to me and said, oh, could you do it again? and they hadn't sought dental care in between, I think I'd then be starting to go, well, hang on a tick, we need to be onto some yeah. dental care here. Because the reality around a fractured filling is a fractured filling is an indicator for a dentist that there may be other issues with this tooth. Mm. So, you know, you're, you, you've joined a road that needs some intervention. Mm -hmm. So don't let it just, don't just become the temporary filling expert of your town, all right? No. 
one of the things I found quite helpful is to ask the reception staff to make the patient's dental appointment for them on their way out to pay the bill. Very good idea, <laughs> to actually be aggressive in following that through yeah. for some dental care. I think that's a really good idea. And the other thing that I found useful is uh, a set of um, operating loops with the light pointing oh, directly yeah. where, you, okay. where you're looking. Yeah. Because, of course, doctors aren't used to sitting you're not, there you're with not... a light and a mirror. So we yes. just, But if we look directly, we can at least see what's going on in there. Yes. Um, other ones I've seen doctors use is actually lay per people on a patient bed Mm -hmm. and then use the overhead light yeah. and stand at the, not next to them like you normally do, stand at the head end. So move the furniture a bit and stand yeah. at the head end. Um, that's a really good way of doing it as well. Um, it also helps with keeping the saliva off where you're working. Yeah. So, uh, there, yeah, you obviously need some light, a miner's <laughs> light, whatever you've got. Now, a lot of our country patients come in with a considerable number of fillings, particularly in their teens and early 20s. And... I was wondering, is that something to do with many of them being raised on farms on tank water rather than having the fluoridated, you know, normal water that comes through? Yeah. You know, uh, uh, just so people understand, fluoride has been an astonishing... It's listed in the top four public health initiatives of the last hundred years mm -hmm. in the world. It's an astonishing journey. To, to give you some concept, uh, in the mid-60s, prior to fluoridation, yeah. a 12-year-old had 12 holes. 12 for 12. Today, a 12-year-old has less than one hole, and that journey is about fluoride. So uh, and just for the biology of it, uh, fluoride changes the uh, crystalline structure on the surface of teeth yep. and makes it resistant to the acid dissolution that you know, is the byproduct of bacteria. Mm. So uh, fluoride is a really important element in the protective processes in dentistry. So for country uh, kids who were just on the tank water, yeah. is the fluoride in their Tough Teeth Mrs Marsh toothpaste sufficient for them to build a normal set of enamel or yeah. do they actually need a fluoride supplement? Okay, um, today we don't recommend fluoride supplements anymore. Mm -hmm. um, certainly fluoride, fluoridated toothpaste. Now um, in Australia, all toothpaste is fluoridated to the right concentration, it's a national standard, except for the fluoride, except for the toothpaste you buy at some health food shops and things, the, yeah. the unique ones. But fundamentally, blue and gold, Coles, Woolies, whatever, it all has the appropriate level of fluoride in it. Um, and, and, th and that is adequate for people who are in unfluoridated regions. Now, there are some nuances in this. Um, dental decay is a decay of poverty. So people who are in the poorer members of your community, um, they, they, there is all these options around infant and child toothpaste and all this sort of story that you will mm -hmm. see. There's ads for it and things. Um, the reality in the communities we're talking about unfluoridated and poverty um, would be adult toothpaste is a reasonable usage for, you know, children as well. Yeah. The important thing here is you don't want kids consuming the tube of toothpaste, mm -hmm. okay, because it's about body weight and fluoride consumption and things. So, uh, you know, keep it out of reach. You know, mm -hmm. Treat it as something important. So yeah. keep toothpaste out of reach of children and use, you know, on the TV ads you see them roll out 40,000 kilos of toothpaste on yes. each toothbrush. <laughs> No. Looks beautiful on Looks the Looks great own. on the telly. Tiny little dob. But the reality is it's just a tiny little dob. Um, technically we call it a pea size, but who cares? Just a tiny little dob of toothpaste is adequate. Um, and it's uh, the exposure to that fluoride mm -hmm. is actually, we know it's quite significant effect. So you don't need the days of fluoride tablets, the days of fluoride drops, they're gone. So uh, toothpaste. When we're talking to parents about dental hygiene, because you do yep. look into a lot of kids' mouths while you're checking their, checking their tonsils and so you notice their gums and teeth, is it worthwhile recommending things like, uh, like the little paediatric electric toothbrushes or whatever if you think that they're not getting a good clean? Yeah, with kids, uh, really, um, uh, parents should be intervening and, and actually assisting in brushing. 
I, mm. I don't... Well, mind you, you've got to look at the parents' teeth as well. <laughs> yeah, that's true, but, you know, um, parents should be assisting their children in brushing. That's the mm. reality, until they're dexterous enough to yeah. cover their teeth properly. So, uh, uh, it, it, you know, it's actually an event, you know, parents help kids brush their teeth. Um, if, if the, the question is really around, is electric toothbrushes better than manual toothbrushes, you know, is, mm -hmm. is brand X at $50 a brush better than brand Y? The reality is um, it's about, uh, there is no difference between electric and manual, although if you're a sufferer from arthritis or you, you have a dexterous, dexterity issue, then of course an electric toothbrush is the way to go. Um, but for normal, healthy, happy people, uh, manual toothbrushes are just as good as electric toothbrushes. Um, the trick here is to purchase a toothbrush that is not uh, super hard bristles. Yep. Now... Um, do they still make those? They do. They do. <laughs> and I think the best use for them is sort of cleaning the carburetor on the car and uh, your teeth. <laughs> They're quite good for the shower, yeah. They're good for the shower, yeah. Um, but uh, for teeth... Keep towards the softer end of the spectrum, medium to soft. Um, and when you brush your teeth, I know, you know, we've all heard over the years exotic techniques for brushing teeth. But really, it's not a technique issue. It's about making sure that you cover every tooth surface, tops and sides, and you cover the margin, the edge where it joins the gum. Yep. So that's the, the key to this and helping instill in children and, and teenagers a systematic approach to brushing your teeth. I see a lot of patients who say, oh, the dentist tells me I'm brushing too hard close to the gum and my gums are receding. Yes. Um, What's happening there? Yeah, um, you know, and I'm sure lots of us have experienced when you sit in the lounge room and you hear friends or partners brushing their teeth and you can hear the noise of the bristles going across their teeth. Mm -hmm. um, clearly that is going to damage teeth. Um, so you don't want to be sort of pressing with maximum force to try and brush the teeth. You just want a sort of reasonably light to medium force as you brush. And the other trick here is when you pick a brush up to brush your teeth, it's so easy just to brush in straight lines. Mm -hmm. Well, you're brushing straight lines across a curve of teeth. So the teeth at the expose of the curve are going to get brutal force upon them. Mm -hmm. So when you brush, you need to adapt around the curve. Don't just, you know, in the middle of the night, grab your brush and do two straight lines and call it quits sort of thing. There's actually, you need to practice to get the curve mm -hmm. of a brush going. Once the patients have that kind of gum recession and they've got exposed dentine, is there anything that can be done about it? Look, there is, at the moment, there is no growing it back. Mm -hmm. So it is a one-way ticket, that journey of exposing teeth. There are, there are ways you can reduce sensitivity and there's ways you can stop the damage going further, but at the moment we can't grow gums back. Mm -hmm. So it is a one-way story there. There's another issue that burns in the hearts of uh, the parents of children who have to have fillings, and that is, am I poisoning my child with mercury amalgam and yeah. should all my amalgam fillings be yeah. taken out to improve my arthritis? Yeah. What's the evidence? Well, I think the short answer to that, there is, there, is, there is not evidence that amalgam fillings cause any of the sequence of conditions that we, we hear about and read about. Mm -hmm. um, so there's however, no systemic mercury absorption at all from it? Um, well, however, I would say that uh, we do know that blood mercury levels do rise at the time you have the filling. Mm -hmm. And, be clear, at the time you cut a filling out. Yeah. Um, in the intervening 10, 20, 30 years or whatever, yep. because the mercury is molecularly bound up in the amalgam, there's, mm -hmm. no, uh, there's no continuous flow of mercury out of it. Mm -hmm. So the real risk, the irony in this is the real risk is to the dentist mm -hmm. who sits there inhaling drilling and cutting and inhaling this stuff mercury. all the time. And in fact, they have higher blood levels of mercury than patients mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, you know the, the and it's purely a theoretical thing but the theoretical uh, is that if you had six or eight amalgams and you and you said I want them all out your your blood levels of mercury go up as they're being cut out yeah so 
Uh, no, there is no, uh, there's no strong evidence. Now, I will say that there is uh, a number of countries in the world have uh, stopped using amalgam fillings. Yeah. Now, the reason for that is actually not related to the dental part. It's related to the environmental effects of all the mercury that goes down the drains mm -hmm. from, uh, from dentists dental cutting surgery. out. Yeah. And so we now have all sorts of um, systems for collecting it inside dental chairs and things and, and removing it from the environment. So uh, dentists are environmentally friendly now. They try and reduce the mercury flow into our waterways and things. Mark, could you talk to us a little bit about mouth and gum lesions? Those are often very confusing for medical practitioners because we don't, I mean, we look at tonsils, but we don't really grope around in mouths all that much. Um, things like those big lip boil looking things that you see, which I think are mucous cysts of some yeah, sort in yeah. kitties, yeah. and the kind of leukoplakia that we might be worried about, except that you look at a lot of white things in a mouth and you're and not you're quite not sure so what you worry about. Yeah. <laughs> what should you worry about? Um, to be honest, mouth lesions are tricky for dentists too. It's not a, yep. it's not a simple patch of the world, really. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose the number one thing that you know, I, should, I want to talk about, and I've got a couple of images here that we're looking at uh, that show um, squamous cell carcinoma. And squamous yep. cell carcinoma is the, is the concern, life-threatening concern, yeah. Um, in, in oral cavities, the, the two core places to be looking is the lateral side of the tongue yep. um, and the floor of the mouth, which is the, the lower image here you can see as well. So they're the two spots to be looking in someone's mouth. Grab their tongue with a bit of gauze, pull it out and have a look, lateral surface, left and right, and lift it up and have a look in the floor of the mouth. Mm -hmm. If you do see an ulcer, you know, 99 times out of 100, it's not going to be squamous cell carcinoma, obviously. Um, you're looking for an ulcer that has some sort of raised edges to it, you know, where the mitosis is happening yep. um, in it. Um, and, and you're looking for an ulcer. Often they're not painful. So a patient, some patients will not actually even know that they've got an ulcer mm -hmm. there if it's a squamous cell carcinoma. Whereas a traumatic one, they will go, oh, yeah, I poked myself with my fork or, you know, they'll have some... They've got logic. a broken tooth sitting or, just there. will be something there. I, what I would recommend is uh, a... Uh, Take a mental picture of that abscess, draw, draw uh, that uh, ulcer, draw a little picture in your notes, get them back in a week and see where you're going. Is it resolving? Mm -hmm. If it's resolving, yeah, hold a week. You can often put a digital photo in the notes, digital which photo, I find if you can do. exceptionally useful. Uh, if it's resolving, then you're on a good path. If it hasn't resolved, then I would be uh, raising flags rapidly. Mm -hmm. So a week is about the right time. A week or ten days. And get them to do some mouth washing or something during uh, that time. Yeah, what you do could, you but you don't. You don't have you know salty rinses people have used, but really a, a, a traumatic ulcer should just sort of resolve rapidly. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, with squamous cell carcinoma, particularly of the tongue, where the lymphatic drainage is uh, across across the midline, so the uh, morbidity with squamous cell carcinoma is very high in the oral cavity. So do make sure you get on the path fast. Yep. And uh, uh, I would recommend uh, probably as a doc not doing the biopsy. Mm -hmm. I think leave that to an expert. Just move them down the path to expertise to get this treated. Yep. Um, if you are used to doing bi biopsies of mucosal surfaces, which some people are, then take one at about 10 days. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, but, you know... Uh, to be honest, if you're worrying that this is a squamous cell carcinoma, I think you're probably somewhat like I would be, is I would rather have the specialist team yep. mount a proper challenge here. And to whom would you refer that? Oral surgeon? Yes. Um, look to uh, Royal Perth Hospital, Fremantle Hospital, one of the oral surgical teams mm -hmm. in Western Australia. Um, usually those uh, oral cancers cases are uh, treated in a multi-disc team approach so head to some of the yeah. major hospitals. What about the patients who just have leukoplakia? Yeah, <laughs> you know, all the... You know, Which you think, oh, there's a, there's a whitey-looking thing in this patient's mouth. I wonder if that's... Yeah, and I have to confess, I'm no expert in this. This is sort of getting on the edge of my knowledge set. Um, the, white lesions and all these variants on these white, you know, these lesions, I would recommend that you get them on the line to a dentist to be looked at. Mm -hmm. When the dentist comes, let's make this, let's make a proper referral and get this stuff looked at. 
because some of those white lesions, as you're well aware, some of those white lesions can turn nasty at various points in their, in their white lesion life. Yeah. And others can stay just as boring, you know, you, you know, dental people look at them going, oh, that's boring and I'm not interested sort of thing. But get them some, a, a review. Mm -hmm. If you see something in a mouth, get it reviewed. Um, and get it followed up and, mm. and make sure in your, like you did uh, with your patient who needs a little temporary filling, get your receptions to ring up and make the appointment. I'd be following that aggressive early path to have those followed up. Quite a lot of the patients after their follow-up just come back with one of those um, beclomethasone puffers yeah. called Cuvar, which have got the, the yep. fine spray and they're just squirting that yep. around their mouth. Yep. Then they come back in with thrush. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, it, it, is a, it is a management, you know, those yeah. issues are a management problem. And, and, but usually once they're connected with a dentist, they will, uh, or, or in, in lots of those cases, with a specialty service around uh, mm -hmm. oral medicine. And in Western Australia, we have uh, oral medicine uh, specialists um, mm -hmm. at the Oral Health Centre of Western Australia, yep. which, uh, and also at Fremantle Hospital and some private ones as well. So uh, there are specialists around who will, you know, keep that sort of the problems of the treatment under management yeah. as well. If we can get a truly beautiful photograph, um, is this something that's amenable to telehealth? The, uh, um, uh, yes. The question or, or, that Pat's always asks. <laughs> uh, it's, it's something that's amenable to uh, email consultation because you can produce mm -hmm. a high-res photo and send it to people. So, yes, I would make contact with some oral medical people and have a talk about it. Finally, with those kinds of things, mouth ulcers. Nightmare for some patients who get heaps of them. Yeah. What's your best tip? Me, personally, I get mouth ulcers. I'm, I'm still of the old hot, salty rinses. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, there's actually very little evidence to say it does anything other than psychological good, but I think it does good for me. <laughs> And uh, uh, a cup of water, as warm as you can bear it, a teaspoon of salt, rinse it around, spit it out, and uh, that's a, a, a process of just keeping them clean and healthy. And Mark, is there anything else that you think that we GPs, particularly in the country, should know about dental issues? Are there any other things that you would like to raise? I suppose the only thing I'd like to emphasise is that, you know, you guys have a real opportunity, and I'm going to hark back to the toothpaste story. Toothbrushes and toothpaste, you know, fluoride has been a huge winner in the world. And if you can have that as part of your normal daily business to be on the journey of making sure people brushing their teeth with fluoridated toothpaste, you will make a very large contribution to your community. So. If I leave you, it's a bizarrely simple message, isn't it? If I leave you with the simplest of simple messages, toothpaste. Well, that's all we have time for. And thank you very much to Professor Mark Tennant for once again being part of our program. Now, remember, if you'd like to review this or any other program going back to 2008, you can visit the Rural Health West website at ruralhealthwest.com.au. We'll be back on the 6th of March for an update on some medical legal issues. We'll see you then. I'm Jerry Gannon. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>